Hello. Uh, it's good to be together again. Uh, last time after talking about rocks and minerals, I really enjoyed all your questions. For me, that added a lot to the program, and I hope you like this evening's program as well. We're going to change the scale of view a bit this time. We're going to start off looking at the Earth as a whole and talk about our relationship to the Earth, how we understand the Earth, and then we're going to go and build mountains in more than one way. And after we build a bunch of mountains, then we're going to destroy them. All of this is in preparation for the time after this when we're going to see mountains rise and fall within Mission Trails Park. So if we start here. So we start with the uh, Earth as a whole here, the blue marble. And w the thing that strikes you when you look at the Earth first is not Earth, but water. 71% of the Earth's surface is ocean. Well, that's liquid water. You see atmospheric water there, the gas, the water vapor. And down at the south, you see solid water, the ice on top of Antarctica. But what we want to do right now is not just talk about the surface processes. The next thing I want to do is take a vertical slice through the top of the Earth. And let's look at what we see about the Earth's internal structure. So let's start down at the bottom there in the center. And you'll see it's, it's cut in halves to explore different aspects of the interior of the Earth. So on the right-hand side of the bottom there in the gray, it says core metallic. Well, most of the center of the Earth then is, is iron, a lot of nickel and other elements, but it's basically iron. If we look over on the left side there, you see that it's dark gray right at the bottom. The inner core has turned solid. The outer core, colored there brilliantly in red, is still liquid. And this is very significant for us because that's heat. The heat flowing out from that liquid outer core is one of the big sources of energy that we feel as earthquakes. We see it as volcanoes. It drives continental drift. It's the energy behind a whole lot of things. Now, let's go up to the top, top of the diagram on the left-hand side there. Uh, there was the atmosphere, the gas, the hydrosphere, well, fancy way of saying the ocean. Then lithosphere, it says solid. That's a solid outer shell on, on the Earth. It's about 60 miles thick. And then below that, you'll see that term asthenosphere, and it says soft plastic. What it's really trying to say is, it's a solid, but it's something that deforms. And what I want to do right now is use a metaphor that probably every geologist in the country uses, and that is to look at the whole Earth as if it were a hard-boiled egg. If we go back to the center there again, the core would be the yolk. All that brown area there, the mantle, would be the white of the egg. And in the upper left there, the lithosphere, the thing that says it's solid, 60 miles thick on the Earth, well, that would be the brittle eggshell on the hard-boiled egg. And you know, if you take that hard-boiled egg and crack it and go to pull the pieces off, you know how they kind of slide around and they don't come off real easily? Well, that would be the asthenosphere, the soft plastic. So what we're going to see then is ultimately we want to work with the lithosphere here, hydrosphere, atmosphere. We're going to see how all these things work together. Now, there's another whole concept I want to get into here. And go back, if you will, to the top middle of the diagram there, where it says density in grams. This is be the specific gravity. And you notice that uh, we start with water as one. We arbitrarily say water has a density or specific gravity of one, and then we compare everything to that. And you see up there it says the ocean, a 1.03, because, well, the water of the ocean has a lot of salts in it. But see the white there labeled as continent with the green vegetation top on it? 2.7, 2.7 times as dense as the water. And notice below the white continent there in the brown, that uppermost mantle, about 3.3 specific gravity. And then as we go on down, you see the numbers getting larger and larger till the center of the core there where it's 16 times as dense. But what I want to talk about here right now is the Earth not being a solid. And, and what I want to do is just this. You know, you've been out on a boat at times, you, and you, know, you get tired of the rock and rolling, you get off the boat and you say, ah, oh, it's good to get my feet back on solid ground, good old terra firma. No, no, the Earth is not a solid. It's not intuitive, but the Earth is actually a series of floating layers. Now go back up to the middle top of the diagram there. If we say that the ocean, the water, floats on top of the rocks, yes, that's part of our day-to-day -day experience, we know that. But look over there at the continent at 2.7 specific gravity and 3.3 mantle below it. Are the continents floating on the mantle beneath? 
Yes, yes, they are floating. Now, from the surface up there at the top to the center of the Earth, that's almost 4,000 miles. Now, just visualize this. How about if we put a glacier there on the continent that's one mile thick? And you say, well, 4,000 miles of rock beneath that one mile glacier, can that 4,000 miles support that mile thick slab of ice? No. Actually, the surface of the Earth will sink hundreds of feet underneath the weight of that ice. I mentioned it one, just philosophically, it, it's rather interesting. It's, I think, non-intuitive that the Earth is a series of floating layers. But you know, let me apply it another way. I think one of the things that freaks people out the most about geology are the, the earthquakes. And I think that's because people think the Earth's a solid beneath the ground, and all of a sudden the solid Earth ruptures and moves. It doesn't really compute well in your brain. Well, rewire it. Recognize that the Earth is a series of floating layers. It's moving up and down all the time, and we get some horizontal movements too, and some of those are brittle enough that they're earthquakes. So the earthquake's always a surprise at the moment, but for understanding the Earth, it's moving parts all the time anyway, so there's no real big surprise there. Now, one other thing I'd like to focus on here, uh, go back up to the top middle again, where I drew the continent and the oceans, and you see the white and the green and the blue. Now, when I drew that, I had to exaggerate the size of the continents. If I drew the size of the continents and ocean to scale, you see the little thin black line at the top of the mantle there going underneath the continent? The continents and oceans would fit inside that line. You wouldn't even be able to see them. So what I'm after here is a, a size thing. I think intuitively, I think we tend to visualize size in comparison with us. We stand five or six feet tall. Uh, if we hold it in our hand, it's small. If a mountain, it's big. But if you just consider the Earth as a whole, it's really two things. A iron-rich core, in other words, metallic meteorites in the past, a rocky mantle, stony meteorites in the past, and a little thin film of watery, light minerals floating on the top, that is, the continents and the oceans. So <clears throat> size, where we're just finishing, I say at five and six feet tall, we can't really understand the Earth if we use ourselves as a measuring stick, if you will. So if you really want to understand the Earth, you have to recognize we're simply in a little thin film at the surface of the Earth, and so the changes that seem big to us are very trivial compared to the Earth. So change the size criterion by which you think about the Earth. And let's also go now to the age of the Earth. I mean, for us, a century, 100 years, that's a lot of time to us. What's 100 years to the Earth? Well, the Earth is four and a half billion years old. So same idea. You cannot understand the Earth on human times. When people talk about all oh, the catastrophism and the mountains rose up and all, yeah, you've seen that. The earthquakes we have, each one of those earthquakes is a mountain building event, if you will. And how we understand the Earth is that those earthquakes that we experience, where the Earth moves a few feet, what does it take then to be able to build a mountain? Well, we have to take those small movements on each earthquake, and I say small on an earthly scale, and then over a long length of time, it adds up to big results. So that's a very important principle in geology is, is you have millions of years to work with. So if you see something happening slowly and it doesn't look like much is going on, you've got a lot of time to multiply that by. Now, if we look here at this stunning diagram or this image, well, there'd be San Diego, of course, would be up there near the upper left, the Baja California Peninsula, the Gulf of California. And geologically speaking, what's happened is the peninsula has been ripped away from mainland Mexico. If we went back in geologic time, San Diego would be part of the state of Sonora, Mexico. And so how old is the Gulf? Now, now not the water. The ocean water just fills in the low places everywhere. That age is the same. I'm talking about the basin, the Gulf of California. Now, I want, you, I want to say a number, and I want you to do react to that inside. The, the Gulf, the basin, is five and a half million years old. Now, I hope your reaction was, wow, that's a short time. In other words, let's put it this way. The tearing away of the Baja California Peninsula and San Diego from Mexico, that has moved at about the speed your fingernails grow. Well, you can't watch your fingernails grow, but 
you know in a month's time, you certainly know they've been growing. Well, now take that and multiply it by five and a half million years, and you've got the Gulf of California. That's how we understand the Earth, on its time scale and on its size scale. Now, the other thing we're going to have then is there's our field for the Earth as a whole. It's a very energetic planet. We're going to have energy flows from the interior. We mentioned a little bit already. We're going to have some from the exterior. And a lot of these things work in cycles. Tectonic cycle, I think plate tectonics, I hope is something people are well familiar with by now. This is uh, a concept that's over 50 years old right now and very unusual thing in science. Usually any theory that's out there has a lot of detractors and people who aren't so sure about it, but plate tectonics has just been overwhelming in its acceptance because the data are so powerful. And let's go here and look at the Earth as a whole now. On this map of the Earth, each one of those blue dots represents an earthquake epicenter. And by an epicenter, that means the Earth cracked and moved along two sides at each one of those spots. And of course, the interesting thing is when you look at it, earthquakes are not randomly distributed. Doesn't that look like one of those connect the dot puzzles? And if you connect the dots, you're going to be outlining the tectonic plates. Now, I'm going to jump ahead to the next diagram. But look here where it says Pacific Ocean right now, right in the middle. The next diagram is going to be ex centered exactly the same. And if we go to that next diagram, you'll see there's the Pacific plate. Each one of those colored plates there, let's go back to our hard boiled egg. Remember when we took the hard boiled egg and broke it on the table and it broke into small pieces and big pieces? Well, there's the eggshell pieces there, the small pieces and the big pieces. In yellow in the center, there's the Pacific plate, but you notice to the right of it, there's the Nazca plate heading towards South America, and above the green Nazca plate, there's the gray Cocos plate, in other words, smaller eggshell pieces. If we go back to the Pacific Ocean again, go back over there and look towards South America. See how the epicenters offshore are defining the Nazca plate, the one that's colored green, and look how they're defining the Cocos plate above that. Now, these pieces of eggshell, just like when you're trying to pluck a piece of eggshell off of that hard-boiled egg, these plates move also. And let, let's, let's keep looking at the Pacific plate. That's a nice big plate, so that's a good one for us to uh, kind of analyze. Same general view here. We're looking at the Pacific plate, and the, in the lower right, the dashed parallel, or the parallel lines there next to each other, those are the spreading centers. And what the red arrows are showing there, that is where the plates are moving away from each other. They're pulling apart there. And as the black arrow shows, the big piece of eggshell, the Pacific plate, is moving towards Asia where it collides. And of course, that collision was quite spectacular 10 years ago in Japan, the 2011 magnitude 9 earthquake and that overwhelming tsunami. That all began because of that spreading or pulling apart down there off of South America. So we have with the red arrow a pull apart boundary on the plate. With the uh, violet arrow there, we see a collisional one. The other boundary is the slide pass, our San Andreas Fault. So there's the three things a plate can do. They can pull apart, they can collide, or they can slide past each other. So we come back and look kind of in a 3D model and if we start off and say, well, we pull these plates apart, if gravity pulls these things apart, then the rock at depth is superheated. Let me pause a moment. The temperature of the rocks, the temperature we live with at the surface of the Earth, what happens to temperature as you go below the surface and you, and you go down to depth, what happens to temperature? It gets hotter and hotter. So when we look at the diagram there, if we're going to pull things apart and they're superheated down here, then some of that hot rock is going to liquefy and flow up as magma. And so we're going to build volcanoes there within that spreading center. Now, as they spread apart, there's the magma filling the gap, but as these things pull apart, I show the ocean lithosphere going down. Now let's go back to what we were talking about. On the right there, labeled continent. Remember that specific gravity was 2.7? The ocean floor is 3.3. So when 3.3 specific gravity collides with 2.7 specific gravity, 
Heavy goes down, lightweight stays up. So our other boundary, there again we could say, well if we want to we could say the world's most famous slide pass boundary, you all know the name of it, what's the world's most famous slide pass fault? The San Andreas. Now here's a National Geographic uh, illustration of the Atlantic Ocean and, and what I want you to see here is a mountain range. One of the things we're going to be doing here was, was building mountain ranges. Well, go up to the top of the, of the map there where the mountains are started. And you come down a little ways and, oh, there's Iceland sitting right on the spreading center. But if you just follow your eyes down the mountains, all the way down past the, uh, North America, South America, down heading over into the Indian Ocean, there's the world's longest mountain ranges, but we don't really get the chance to appreciate it because for the most part, it's underwater. But what's happened there? The plates have pulled apart, the magma has risen there, so what are these mountains going to be made of? What's going to be the main rock type there? We did that last time, That's, that would be the basalt, like the lava flows on Hawaii, if you will. Uh, you see the same things at Iceland, one of the world's most popular tourist spots at the present time. So there's one of our ways to make mountain ranges, pull plates apart, have magma rise up in the gap, and build long mountain ranges. I love this diagram. This is 100% science, but you look at those colors and gosh, I, I just feel like framing it and hanging it on the wall. And let's go back to the Atlantic Ocean here again. It's kind of running down the middle again. And you see all these different colors. If you come down the Atlantic Ocean, the top of the mountain range we were just looking at is colored red. Look down to the bar scale at the bottom, if you will, and go to the left-hand side. Those numbers are in millions of years, and the red means zero. That's the active volcanoes. And look, let's run our eyes on the bar from left to right. It goes red, orange, yellow, light green, light blue, dark blue. And you notice that we're getting older and older and older. When we get to dark blue, we're about up to 200 million years old. Well, let's look at the east coast of the United States. Go out to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, look at those colors. Red, orange, yellow, green, light blue, dark blue. What are we seeing there? The evidence of seafloor spreading. So magma's coming out there, age zero, solidifies, and as it's pulled apart, look at the ages. They get older, 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 till you're 200 million years old by the time you get next to the east coast of the United States. So there we're seeing, again, proof. When I said it's very unusual to have a scientific theory so widely ex uh, accepted, well, there's one proof. That's not the only one. There's lots of proofs, but the data sets proving things are so stunning that that's why we think plate tectonics is one of the ways we can literally describe how the Earth works. Now, here's one of these diagrams we want to look at here. We're just talking about the spreading center, pulling the plates apart and the magma rises. Now, we're going to look at a, a closer view then of the plates as they pull apart and here goes the subduction. Here goes that heavier 3.3 specific gravity plate big pull underneath the continent. And now, what's going to happen? We tap into that rock that's not fully solid, that rock that actually deforms. It was called the asthenosphere, or not, I don't, uh, well, I guess there's the word in the middle of the screen there. But the asthenosphere, the word's not as important as the fact that it's hot rock, so hot it's, it, that it deforms or flows some at 60 miles depth. When the plates pull down there and hits that, that starts magma rising up. But unlike the ocean floor, that magma has to fight its way up through 60 miles of overlying rock. And that means pieces of that rock are going to fall into it, that basaltic magma is going to be contaminated, and we're going to get something that's more, well, if we said those mountains were the Andes, we could say the Andesitic rocks. So last time we talked about basaltic volcanic rocks, there they are out in the ocean. We talked about andesitic volcanic rocks, there they are on the, in the volcanoes on the continent edge. So we've built two sets of mountains in, basalt mountains in the ocean, andesitic mountains there on the continent edges, and let's do a third. Now, in the breakup of Gondwanaland, you, you're familiar with that, that southern continent, that huge supercontinent we had, Gondwanaland? Around 200 million years ago, it started breaking into pieces, 
And one of those pieces, we could just call it India here. And if you look to the, to alongside each of those different colored positions, you'll see ages, like sep down there at the bottom. 71 million years, 55, 38, 10, and now. So we see that, that uh, India has risen up and collided with Asia. So here's a map of that. And on the right is, are, is uh, taken from a experiment done with some plasticine kind of material, where the, as you can see down at the bottom of the three diagrams, you see a, like a two by four hunk of wood with a black arrow on it. You shove it into those layers of plasticine, and what happens is they deform. Well, what happens here if we shove India into Asia? It deforms. And you see above the point of the violet arrow there, Tibetan Plateau? When you think about that, well, well, when we think about the 48 states of the US, the tallest mountain peak, Mount Whitney, is only 14,000 some odd feet high. That whole Tibetan Plateau area averages more than 15,000 feet high. That entire region is higher than the top of Mount Whitney. And when we look at this diagram, at first, I don't know if it overwhelms you as much as it ought to, because you don't have a scale there. But that is the whole Tibetan plateau. That's China at the top. That's India and Pakistan below. The line of snow-covered peaks running over to the left, that's the Himalaya Mountains. Within all those snowy mountains over there in the upper left, we have things such as Mount Everest. So if I back up a second and say, whoa, we're looking at that big of a mountains, look at that Tibetan plateau, that high, high, over three mile high, huge area lifted up. So there have mountain peaks on it, like Mount Everest, but the whole plateau is a huge, broad, uplifted mass as well. And uh, for those of you who haven't climbed to the top of Mount Everest, well, that would include me, but uh, for those who haven't, and, you, and, and as a good geologist, you'd want to take a piece of rock to look at, what rock would you find at 29,000 plus feet elevation? a limestone full of seashells. So what are we looking at here? What we're looking at here is, <coughs> we're, looking at, uh, <coughs> we're looking at a third type of mountain building here. Now this particular time, let's do this. Can I take this arm here and say this is Asia? And take this arm here and say this is India? Well, if this is 2.7 specific gravity, and this is 2.7 specific gravity, and underneath them is 3.3. When they collide, which one goes down? Which one subducts? And the answer, of course, is neither. No matter how big it is, if it's less dense, it's not going to sink. So what happens? India rides up on top of Asia, and so what now? Now my arm is the Tibetan Plateau, and then on top of the Tibetan Plateau, we have mountain peaks like Everest. So there's a third way we make mountains, by colliding continents. So now if we have built mountains three ways, we can look at those here and say, well, let's think about Mission Trails now. If the Mission Trails mountains had been built by spreading centers, what kind of rocks would we expect to see? When we pull it apart, it uh, liquefies and basalt rises. No basalt in Mission Trails Park. Continent collision, when you're walking, doing your five peak challenge, going from Coles Mountain to North Fortuna and Kwaipai and such, seen any limestone or sandstones, any fossils, anything? Uh, no continent collision here. When you look at subduction, do you see igneous rocks with intermediate compositions, part gray, part white, uh, kinds of things you'd see in the Andes Mountains? Well, yes. So it's just from our review of three kinds of mountain buildings right there, we did it in enough detail that you can begin to see, and which we'll do in detail next time, how were the mountains in Mission Trails Park built to begin with? Subduction, subduction of a tectonic plate going beneath North America. Details in two weeks. Now, what we're looking at here with all of these, we've just used three different ways to build mountains. Where does that energy come from? We talked about that at the beginning. The liquid outer core is hot, that heat's flowing to the surface. Also, the mantle has loads of radioactive isotopes in it that are decaying, putting energy in. 
So that energy flow, which we call internal energy, because it's coming from the center of the Earth flowing out to the surface, there it is building the mountains we've just been looking at. So, so it's internal energy builds land, constructs land. The other thing we want to look at today is how do we destroy land? We built the mountains, what does it take to destroy them? And that's external energy from the sun. And we'll look at that in detail. That solar energy comes in, uh, hydrologic cycle. If we look at that, this is one of the oldest things that humans have figured out is the hydrologic cycle. Look in the, in the upper right there, there's the, the sun. About 25% of the solar energy, the sunlight that comes in, is used to evaporate water. And you see the water, the cycle. The water goes as clouds, it goes over the land. If it's high land or high latitude, it falls the snow and makes glaciers. Uh, or it makes rain, which runs off as streams. And you notice there at the bottom of the diagram, some of that water goes underground. But where do they all go? The glaciers, the rivers, the groundwater flow, ultimately, they're working their way back to the ocean. So it is the solar energy, the external energy from the sun that is destroying the mountains that were built by the internal energy from the center of the earth. Now, let's take the hydrologic cycle apart in terms of agents of erosion. We just were mentioning things, you know, glaciers, streams, and so forth. Let's look at the role of each of those kinds of things to see how it is they do their work. Now, I love this image. So as you see, there's the United States uh, running across the middle, and you see in the lower part of Canada and the upper part of uh, Mexico. And you notice that where are the mountains? They're basically the western third of the US. I mean, here in California, we think of ourselves earthquake country, lots of impressive mountains, yes. But when you look at the whole of the United States, goodness gracious, come over there uh, near the Texas-New Mexico border, and come up through New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, mountains, Rocky Mountains, all the way up. Rocky Mountains, we have mountain building all the way to the coastline right there. We see, where's the action? Where's the tectonic mountain building action in the United States? In the western third. So there's youthful mountains still being built, still growing. Now, if we go over to the east, well, there's the Appalachians. Now we're looking at mountains that basically have been destroyed. I mean, Appalachians are beautiful. You've, you've walked in it. They're great places for vacations. I'm not knocking them. But compared to what we have in the western US, these mountains have been destroyed. You start up there in the upper right in Maine and New Brunswick, and, and you come down all the way down uh, south there with the, the mountain ranges. And they are only basically the worn down roots. And when you, when you look at those, well, here, here, here's a diagram or an image. So in the upper right is uh, Pennsylvania. Down in the lower left, that white patch is there. Uh, that's snow in West Virginia. And over on the lower right, the, the water you see up there, that would be the upper part of Chesapeake Bay, just to kind of frame how big of an area you're looking at here. And when you look at those rocks, those intricately folded rocks, do you get the feel of, of uh, sedimentary rocks? Uh, it may be a, a leap asking you to jump that far ahead in the interpretation, but those are sedimentary rocks. And how did we build mountains topped by sedimentary rocks? By continent collisions. The continent collision in this particular case was between Northwest Africa, in today's terms, and the Eastern US. And that occurred something like 320 million years ago to 260 million years ago. So the mountains were built by continent collision but since that time, there's been a tremendous amount of time, and they're worn down to, well, worn down now. Compare what their size is now. They were formed by the same processes, not as big, but the same processes as made these Tibetan Plateau and the Himalaya Mountains, and look at them now. Not, not much left compared to what they had, but still beautiful. This is not criticism of Appalachia. This is uh, something we appreciate on a different scale after Solar energy has come in for millions of years. Look what it can do to a beautiful mountain range. Wear it down to a small, but still beautiful mountain range. Agents of erosion. I'd say probably the least appreciated is gravity. But the thing gravity has going for it, remember we were talking about how do you understand things going on on Earth? We talked about small changes over a long length of time. 
What do you see gravity do every day? Not a lot, but it's every minute, every day, every year, every billion years, every hundred million years, and you start adding up that constant pull over time, and it does tremendous work, tremendous work in terms of tearing down mountains. Running water, another agent of erosion. Here's the Colorado River cutting through Canyonlands National Park in Utah. Now, when you look, well, particularly at the bottom of the diagram uh, image and, and the middle and the right, you see that orangish big sandstone layer there? Well, that was a continuous sandstone layer running across there, but you can see how the Colorado River has eaten through it, and this just visualize that whole beautiful canyon with the meandering Colorado River. Visualize how much material has been picked up and carried away by the Colorado River over time. Mountain destruction going on. <clears throat> are you familiar with alluvial fans? Here we are at Badwater in Death Valley. And I, I, what I want you to visualize here is, well, of course, the mountains are obvious, or the base of the mountains are obvious there at the top of the image. But you see the, the valley coming through, and you see it's full of gravels and sand. The flash flood runs between the walls of the valley. But when the flash flood comes out of the valley and doesn't have the walls holding it together, what does it do when it hits the flat below? It spreads out and makes that alluvial fan. So that whole fan of material you see there is what? That, that's former mountain. Pits, bits of mountain broken and carried down to a lower elevation. And there's another thing I'd like you to notice about this. Look at the upper part, the head of the alluvial fan, like right where it's coming out of the river valley. Can you get the feel of gravels, boulders, and things on the surface there? And if you run your eye towards the left from, from the mouth of the river, it looks brownish, very sandy there. Then you see the road, and you notice to the left of the road, what's happening there? Landsliding. Look, see how the earth's being torn apart? Why is that failing in landslides there? Well, that's clayey, muddy rock. So another thing we see about these alluvial fans the coarse sediment, it's up at the head, right near the river valley. The middle is sand, and far out on the end are the clays. So the water decreases in power as it flows out, and the coarser sediment drop out first, then finer, finer, finer. I'm going into a bit of a detail about this right here. This is, a this is one of the world's most beautiful alluvial fans, but I want you to understand those because alluvial fan plays a huge part in the history of Mission Trails Park as we will go over here in, in two weeks. Braided streams. Well, you see why it gets its name. Look at, look at how the water there is divided into so many different little channels, just like a braided hair or braided twine. And basically what we're seeing here in New Zealand is the mountains are eroding so fast, the physical disintegration of the rocks are so fast that the river can't even keep up with it all and carry it away. It's got so much sediment waiting to be carried, it can only carry away large amounts during times of big floods. But we're seeing running water doing its work there again. And then glacial ice. Here we are in the Swiss Alps, and you look up near the top of the, of the image, and you can see the valleys with the glaciers coming out of them. And what I like is, as they join into the major glacier, you see the lines of broken rock that have been brought down by the tributary glaciers, and you see them being carried in streams slowly down slope. Glaciers are very powerful in terms of eroding the landscape. I mean, here is Athabasca Glacier in Alberta, Canada. Uh, take, take your eye up to the upper left, the mountaintop up there, and, and run, run along the top of the land there. It comes down low, back up the other side like a gigantic capital letter U, and then you see the Athabasca Glacier there in between. And it's kind of hard to get the scale but if you look down near the bottom to a the little bit to the right of that one hill, you see a town there. So there's the buildings of a town for scale. So you see that this glacier is actually huge. So why is there that U-shaped gap there? That's all mountain that has been carried away by that glacier. You see the immense destructive power of the glacier there. Now we're gonna to go to another little thing here. Usually when people talk about eroding the land, there's, there's the big four. The uh, gravity, which doesn't get mentioned as much as it should. Glaciers do because of their power, but then glaciers don't occur on most of the Earth. Running water occurs everywhere, 
and then wind. And you usually hear things say, poems, TV shows, whatever. They talk about, oh, the land was eroded away by wind and water. Uh, really? Let's have a look at wind versus water. Now here we are out uh, Ocotillo Wells the, with the dune buggy capital of California, or one of them I should say. And what do we see there? We see on the mountain side, we see a lot of fine silt and sand that's been carried by the wind and piled on top of the mountain. Not eroding the mountain, but burying it by soft sand and silt. If we move around a little farther there in Anza Borrego, near Fonce Point, here we see the badlands where it's running water that is cut into and carried away the sediments. So if I'm gonna talk about something like Mission Trails Park, the work of the wind versus the work of the water, well, I'm gonna be generous. I'm gonna give wind more credit than it deserves. I'm gonna say 1% of the erosion is by wind, the other 99% by water in comparing the two. For Mission Trails Park, gravity is important and running water. We have not had glaciers here during the last 126 million years, so they can't be a part of the Mission Trails Park story. And uh, wind is basically, to the earth, the wind is trivial. It's a mess when it flows in your eyes or, or hits the sand, hurts the paint on your car, but it's not doing much to the earth. Last thing I'm gonna mention is the rock cycle. I hope you've had a chance to go into the Mission Trails Park Visitor Center. Uh, here's a very prominent display you can't miss. Uh, so there is the rock cycle. We'll talk about it on the next image, but I'd like you to do that. And the display there is a hands-on display. Each of those rocks were uh, picked up by Ranger Levi and myself in the park, and they're, they're bolted down there. Uh, I didn't really realize how important it was to bolt things down, but I received an education on that. They are bolted down, and each one of them fits someplace on the rock cycle, and the colors on the wall are the same varying colors on the counter so you know where things came from. So uh, please uh, uh, go to the visitor center, and when you're there, well, it won, has won awards for architecture for those who haven't been there. It's free, no admission. It's uh, award-winning architecture, all kinds of good things. You're hearing my bias right now as a geologist. I wanna make sure you see the rock cycle display. Hands on, please go look touch, read, and let's just go over the rock cycle here one more time. And on the lower left, there's magma. The magma rises at depth. Some cools to be plutonic rocks like we discussed last time. Some of the magma reaches the ground surface as volcanic rocks. Now we've seen the agents of erosion powered by the sun erode and carry the debris, the sediments and dump them in the ocean. If they get buried deeply and have a lot of heat and pressure put on them, they're converted into metamorphic rocks. So there, we've looked at three cycles, tectonic, hydrologic, rock cycle. Uh, we've looked at something here where we get some idea of, of uh, how mountains are built, how mountains are destroyed, and also get a little bit more of a feel for age, size of the earth compared to ourselves. And uh, well, I hope that's background combined next time with what we did on rocks and minerals last time, we'll, we'll apply all of that and use it to solve the history of Mission Trails Park. How did it come to be? So thank you again, and I, I hope, you, hope you join us uh, next time in two weeks. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> do earthquake centers move with the plates? Uh, Well, the ba basically, it's the moving of the plates that, that cause them. So it's, you know, it's the edges of the plates. So if, if, the, uh, if the subduction keeps going down at the same place, then they're still going to be there at that one place. Uh, so, so basically, the earthquakes cluster around the two edges of the plates, particularly the subducting edge. That's where the magnitude 9 earthquakes are and then the slide pass side like the San Andreas where you can get them up to about the magnitude of eight. So the earthquakes basically follow the edges of the tectonic plates. Ah, very good question, hot spots. And you know, first I gotta give a shout out. You know, one of the things about science that's off put putting to so many people, and, and myself included, depending on the topic, is you get these formidable terms to try to remember, like, what in the world is this word? I like this official term, 
hotspot. That's the official geologic term. I like that. Now, what is a hotspot? You know, when we were looking at the that uh, slice through the earth and we looked down deep and we said the outer core was liquid and it just showed the mantle and I said there was a lot of radioactive elements within that. Well, you have pockets where the rock's hotter and in some of those areas where they're hotter, the rocks could actually rise up. We call them plumes where a, ro a solid rock can rise. I may need to pause a moment on that. When I say can solid rock rise through solid rock. The difference here is temperature. If, if one is hot enough, it has a buoyancy and it will work its way through the cooler rock and that plume can come up. And I'd say the world's most famous plume is in the, in the uh, ocean with the Hawaiian Islands because the, 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 the string of the Hawaiian Islands there are, the hot spot is relatively fixed. It moves slower than the Pacific Plate and the Pacific Plate moves over it Probably, possibly the second most famous one is another US one, and that would be Yellowstone. In this particular case, the North American continent has moved over Yellowstone, and that gives us, well, those are the world's biggest kinds of volcanic eruptions that occur there, what they like to call these days super volcanoes. We, the, the last really good one, good one I should say, sizable one we've had in the US was Mount St. Helens back in 1980, so that's going back a bit in time for some of you, but Yellowstone is different. Mount St. Helens, powerful eruption, but it comes out of a mountain, blows the top off of a mountain. The really big volcanic eruptions don't have names of mountains, they're bigger than mountains. So what's it there? Say Lake Yellowstone. It's the hole left by the volcanic explosion, commonly fills with water, like Yellowstone there, or Taupo in New Zealand, and other ones around the world. Those are the really big uh, volcanic eruptions. So why are they in the middle of tectonic plates? Because they don't even know plates are there. The plates, remember, are about 60 miles thick, moving around on the surface of the eggshell. And down here, down deep in the mantle, when some rock gets hot and comes up, it has no idea what's at the surface. It's just, it burns its way through whatever happens to be at the surface. The, the, uh, the, the greenish rock we call Santiago Peak Volcanics. Now, first off, uh, the way, what geologists do with rock bodies, when you're mapping them and working them in the field a lot, you give them names, and the names you give them are from some geographic feature. Now, the Santa Ana Mountains are kind of a chain that will run all the way down here through, through San Diego, you know, with, with Black Mountain, uh, with uh, Del Cerro, with Otay Mountains, and so forth. And uh, they're named after Santiago Peak, which is the highest peak in the Santa Ana Mountains. The one you encounter when you drive up from San Juan Capistrano up and over down to Lake Elsinore, that's Santiago Peak. So that's what we call these. In San Diego, the two main places you get to see them fresh are be there. One is the Mission Gorge Quarry. Another one is it's another big quarry out there in uh, Otay Valley. So they are andesite breccias. They are they are sticky magmas that have exploded their way out and broken the rock into pieces. We were showing some of those like last time uh, for, th for those. The greenish color uh, in the past, well, we get into another thing when you're looking at a rock. When, here's a rock, you're going to say it's igneous or sedimentary, and if you put a lot of heat and pressure on it, when does it turn into enough that you're going to say, oh, that's a metamorphic rock? So in the past, a lot of folks looked at that greenish color which is a, uh, a, an alteration after heat later on. In other words, it's not part of the rock to begin with. And so some have called them metavolcanics, like metamorphosed volcanics. For myself, I look at those rocks, they're clearly volcanic. You can look at the rock class in them and see them easily, so I don't use the word meta. So to me, they're just andesite breccias, andesitic volcanic rocks, and I'm saying most of them. There are other types in there as well, but basically, they're mostly uh, andesitic rocks. The, the, we get layering in two of the three main rock groups. We get layering in sedimentary rocks, you know, with gravels and sands and muds, and then we get layering in metamorphic rocks, some of them where if you took a uh, something that heated up enough and put a, some shear on it, the, you know, the light colored minerals and the dark ones may make, make layers. So there's different kinds of rocks, uh, 
different kinds of layering that come in different ways. And for Mission Trails, the oldest rock that we have dated, which is one from the Mission Gorge Quarry, right next to the boundary of, of uh, Mission Trails Park, we took it from the quarry because it's fresher there and less, less altered, and that's 126 million years ago. That means 126 million years ago it was magma that turned into rock at that time, and that's the oldest thing we've measured to date. I'm not saying we won't find something older at some point, but at this stage of the game, that's the oldest thing we have, 126 million years. Well, a, a lot of the, uh, the quartz we see there is quartz in, in that when, when a magma cools, we come down through a whole set of minerals, and the most abundant two elements are silicon and oxygen. And if we can crystallize out the other minerals, we commonly have a lot of silicon and oxygen left over, and they form quartz. So we have a lot of quartz. A lot of times it's squeezed through cracks in what we call dikes, but a lot of that's because there's so much silicon and oxygen left over that it'll end up make uh, quartz for us. Uh, the KT boundary, that would be the Cretaceous uh, tertiary boundary. Uh, that would be uh, almost 66 million years ago that has become very, very famous because that's the time the Chicxulub asteroid hit near the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula and is famous for all the destruction of life it did uh, around, around the Earth. Uh, it's become so famous, you know, asteroid hits, dinosaurs go extinct. It's become so famous and simple that, it, that a lot of things have been lost. Uh, for one, dinosaurs are not extinct. Non-avian dinosaurs are extinct, but the avian dinosaurs, the birds, are still with us. Uh, the KT boundary, that's very, very interesting. When that idea first came out, it was, it was by a Nobel laureate in physics, uh, <coughs> Alvarez, and he postulated that he wondered if a big asteroid had hit the Earth, and then he said uh, if it did, it would probably have a lot of the elements in it that we see in the core of the Earth. Things like iridium was one that became very famous. There's not much iridium up at the surface. The iridium on Earth is what they call a siderophile element, an element that tends to occur with iron. And for the Earth, most of the iron's down in the core, so the iridium would be down there. So his concept was if, if an asteroid had hit the Earth, one thing you might find is iridium, iridium layer. Or I should say iridium-rich layer. And so that set off uh, a storm of searching. I had my graduate class, a class called, I'll tell you the title of it, you might not want to sign up for it, but how about Petrology of Carbonates? So my graduate class, uh, I already knew there was no KT boundary or 66 billion year old rocks here. We go up to about 72, then we jump up into the 50s. So we're, we're missing that L N uh, area. So down, just uh, down past uh, El Rosario, down in uh, Mesa La Sepultura, in Baja California, I thought there was a real good chance we'd do it there, so I ran, the way you run a lot of geology classes is with field projects, so our project was to go down and, and collect and measure things so carefully and see if we had the KT boundary there, and, and we didn't. And I, and I go through this story just to kind of show you one, uh, what a hypothesis put out like Alvarez did that could be tested, can you find an iridium-rich layer? Now that's science, right? Not ideas. It's not ideas that make science, it's proofs. And so that was a beautiful thing. So we were going to go down and see if, if we could fit in one piece of the puzzle, but that interval of rock happened to be missing down there as well. However, many other places in the world did have it. The next uh, one was found in Gubbio, Italy. One was found in Denmark on the uh, shores of the uh, uh, Baltic Sea, and people started finding them around the world. And as they were finding these iridium-rich layers at the same place, that became one of the major proofs for the fact that the asteroid did hit Earth, uh, and that's one that's about six miles diameter, as we understand it, come in at about 35,000 miles per hour, uh, hit the Earth, and did a lot of disruption to life and, and, and to the Earth. So it's a very fascinating thing. I, again, I go through the long story, kind of give you an idea how, how science works. Th that's, that's the way to do it, if you can. If you can put out a hypothesis, I think such and such happened, and the proof I would look for is such and such, then you're gonna have scientists, well, myself in my class, you'll have ones around the world going to look and see, can you, can you help fill in the puzzle or not? 
And of course, with science, so many times when you go looking for the evidence, you find out that the hypothesis was wrong. And that's another little aspect about science. Uh, you can't fall in love with any of the ideas or the, any of the hypotheses because there's always the chance that new data are going to come up, new information are going to come up, and they're going to destroy that idea of yours. So don't get emotionally attached to it. Stay cool, detached, intellectual, evaluate, and collectively we move ahead with more and more understanding all the time. Do plates ever reverse direction? Uh, sure, they could. You know, if you look at them, uh, I don't know if this is a good analogy or not. How about, they still do bumper cars in the amusement parks where you bang into each other? You know, I as long as, you're, uh, as they're banging into each other, they can change. Or let's put it this way. How about a plume coming up in another place on Earth that fractures the plates there and then causes them to change direction? So as, as some change direction because a plume came up, and then those plates now that we're, that we're going this way are now going that way. They in turn will run into other plates and it's vectors, you know, drawing lots of arrows, force arrows, and you change the force field by putting in a new plate, a new piece moving some direction, then the others have to adjust and change their movement to accommodate it. So the answer is uh, yes, they can reverse direction because plates can be totally subducted and gone. So they're one of the force fields no longer exists and new ones can come into existence. So yes, reversing direction is one of the things that can happen. Uh, local places to gather rocks, and minerals, lakes. Well, you know, <laughs> as, as part of population growth, uh, there used to be a lot of land that uh, nobody really paid attention to, but almost, almost everything is owned by somebody now. Individuals aren't going to allow it. Uh, any national forest, national park, state park, none of those are going to allow it. So they're, they're getting to be uh, harder and harder to find. But I would say uh, parts of the desert, for example, are, are lo looking for areas that are not under private ownership or under um, park maintenance and protection. Oh, yes, yes. Well, now, Torrey Pines, yes, that's, that's a neat thing. Uh, I, I love that. That's one of, the, one of the areas where I've done a lot of work on the rocks out there. These are what we call uh, Eocene age. So out there at uh, the Torrey Pines, these are basically those orangish colored tinted sandstones are largely tidal, former tidal channels. And I say tidal channels, I'm talking about uh, 48 million years ago, 45 million years ago, 42 million years ago during that time frame. Those are sands that were moving in tidal channels, the greenish area. And have you seen the fossils there? When you look at the beach cliffs there, if you'll go up close and look at them, there's oyster banks in there, Austria idriensis. Uh, there's snails, Potomitis carbonicola. There's some neat fossils in there to look at. That's a state park. You can't collect them, photograph them, uh, collect them that way. Collect the images on your iPhone or, or camera. So these are younger rocks now. And uh, what we're going to see next time is in the Mission Trails Park area, we're going to be buried underneath an alluvial fan. But as you go farther to the coast, the alluvial fan area didn't reach all those spots. And that's what a lot of that Torrey Pines area is, is areas that uh, uh, were far enough west to, to uh, have their own different history. Unconformed is visible in Mission Trails Park. Uh, yes, but you know, when I was looking or walking around looking for pictures to take of them, it's hard to find one that's stunning picture-wise. But let's, let's, let's do this here. Um, for those who already know the park, let's, let's, uh, let's park at uh, Jackson Drive parking lot, walk down across the San Diego River, and start going up the other side. Those are Santiago Peak volcanics in there, 126 million years old. As you're going up the road, there's sandstones and all on top of them. Well, those are uh, uh, Eocene age. So there's 42 million year old rocks on top of 126 million year old rocks. And the unconformity it represents the erosion surface. This is one of the biggest frustrations for geologists really is we don't have continuous exposures. So there you have 126 million years here. Here's 42 million on top. Well, what happened to all those millions of years in between? You can't say anything because there's no rocks or fossils there. And those are what the unconformities are, erosion surfaces. Also, I could take some things like uh, uh, one of the pictures I got, had some success with was the uh, 
Mission Gorge Road where it's going up and over the mountains there. Uh, the mountain rocks in that area are 118 million years old and the gravity pulled debris, the alluvial fan type debris coming down on top of it, there you would have stuff that's thousands of years old on top of 118 million years old. So there'd be an unconformity there over 100 million years worth of missing time. So we don't have what I would call textbook picture unconformities, but yes, we do have them in the park. Ah, good eye, good eye, wow, very impressive. Uh, remember that piece of rock, the beautifully colored one, I said, man, oh man, this art thing, it looks like an art thing, you hang on the wall, but it's all science. And I was having you look at the uh, Atlantic Ocean and, and then look at the spreading, so it was red, and say, oh, here it goes orange, yellow, light blue, green, and all that. Uh, somebody was looking very carefully over the Eastern Mediterranean and there was rock there that's purple, the only purple spots on the whole earth. And what has happened there is basically, uh, as Africa has moved north and collided with Europe, uh, are you aware of that? Africa collided with Europe, What's, how, do we know, how do we know that? The collision made the Alps. Well, part of the old seafloor, the Tethys seafloor, has not subducted yet and it's all ch sort of choked up like a clogged drain. So th that's what those 280 million year old rocks are, old seafloor, and those are the things that give us the earthquakes like we just had one in Greece, uh, Italy, the volcanoes erupting there. That's all from that material, that old material trying to be pulled under Europe. Good eye though, a lot of good things to see on that map. All right, I think, um, well gosh, I guess we've run out of time, but well, let's pick it up again. Two weeks, we'll start again and uh, look forward to discussing Mission Trails Park and answering more questions. So thank you again for your interest. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.